Your rights are my responsibility. A man has to decide that he's going to do something. And I'm not listening to your stupid classes. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Bill Roach, and today we got a special episode of Timeless Dialogues because John MacArthur has finally spoken out against Christian nationalism. So what I want to do today is I want to dive into the little segment of his Q&A where he discusses what is Christian nationalism and why you should be opposed to it. But before we do, I want to set just a little bit more of the context upon which we find this. So first and foremost, we all have just recognized that Christian nationalism is something that has just utterly sort of taken over the evangelical world by storm, or so they think it has. What we have to really see is, is that this is a movement that is really just growing within sort of the post-millennial, sort of the theonomy, reformed wing of Christendom. Now it's trying to bleed its way out into to other areas right now, but the predominant voices on this are coming from that particular camp. And that's in one respect, how John MacArthur starts to interact with this. But I think many of you are probably familiar with, you know, this whole notion of Christian nationalism. And I think what you start to notice is, is that everybody says, well, I could be a Christian nationalist insofar as I can define it, which is really sort of subjective meaningless, has no point or value into it. But you also need to ask this other question. Why are there so many people out there that have a different definition of Christian nationalism? Like, don't we live in a world in which we could come to a standard definition of Christian nationalism? Now, I know some of these figures, probably Stephen Wolf in particular is going to say, I have given a specific definition of Christian nationalism. And I go, yes, you have given one, but there are multiple different definitions of Christian nationalism. You know, you have some people that are going to say, well, Christian nationalism is nothing more than Puritan millennialism, or it's going to be something like Christian republicanism, or this concept of manifest destiny, or Lincoln's unionism, or Wilson's idealism, and all the rest. You know, Puritan millennialism look forward to this future millennial sort of thousand year reign of Christ where he's going to establish this you're going to see the church establish this rule. And then at the end of that season, Christ will return or Christian Republicanism and manifest destiny saw America turning its back on the past and turning towards the future or this concept of, you know, Abraham Lincoln cast America as being in the throes of a national death, but also experiencing a new birth of freedom or Woodrow Wilson and John Foster Dulles look forward to an international order with America as an indispensable nation guaranteeing free trade and so on and so forth. And you go, well, man, that's a lot of different definitions of Christian nationalism. And I go, you're right. And I think many of you who have been following me know that I gave a whole talk on this with sovereign nations in which I sort of look at the danger and the draw of Christian nationalism. And one of the things that I pointed out is this, is that we are living in a postmodern age and postmodern sort of linguistics and society is built off of things like linguistic ploys, linguistic word games, power ploys, and so forth. But one of the things you have to find is that there has been this intentional movement by society to label all of these figures as Christian nationalists. And you see this whole point is that whenever they come up with this definition, then they throw this definition and they throw this definition. And what they're doing is, is that they're intentionally blurring these definitions in order to achieve some kind of greater social goal. And we've seen what that has been. If you've seen anything that's come out from federal investigations on this, what there's really a broad attempt to do or MSNBC is to label anybody that's Christian and anybody that's conservative into this camp. But you ask yourself, why? Well, I'll tell you exactly one of the reasons is, is that they want to create some type of legislation against anybody that's Christian and anybody that's conservative in order to label them as a Christian nationalist. Or in other words, as another figure says, they want to January 6th them all. So let me summarize this very quickly before we get into this MacArthur point. You know, one of the things that you have to see up front is that there's a massive dialectical movement that's taking place, intentional blurring for some kind of vertical end goal. And I've discussed that multiple times on this channel, just go search on this. But what I want you to see is, is that the reason that this is important is that you're seeing people who are saying, well, you know, I am a Christian nationalist and I don't follow this dialectic. And I go, 
That's great, and I'm glad you don't follow the dialectic, but what I want you to see is, is that you do not control this conversation right now. The primary narrative arc is being not only defined, but driven by the left on this, and you are manipulated by it, and you're simply reacting to it. In other words, as you would have found from you know other key figures that the real action is your reaction and you would have seen that through figures like Saul Alinsky who talks about that exact concept in his book Rules for Radicals. Now why MacArthur's issue is so important comes down to this is that so many people who are buying into this Christian nationalist movement today would label themselves as theonomists or post-millennialists or even post-liberal in the in the political sense where they're almost acting as though you know we're so far gone from the constitution and there's no binding upon us. And we know who, who some of these key figures are. You know, we know that it's going to be figures like Stephen Wolf in his book, Case for Christian Nationalism. It's going to be a figure like Andrew Torba. It's going to be figures such as William Wolf, who used to work for the federal government in this and went to Southern Seminary. It's going to be other organizations such as American Reformer, and New Founding, and new schools of thought that are out there, or institutions such as New St. Andrews, or Doug Wilson, and and his crew, the whole Moscow mood, and the dozens upon dozens of people on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call them who seem to never sleep at night. So we know where this movement is. You know, you've seen their podcast. You've seen them sort of positioning on this. Now, what I want to do is I want to let you know one of the first places that I saw this. So let's transition over here before we dive into this a little bit more, is that I first found this on the website coming from the Christian Post. And a little bit of what you're going to see here is, is they say, Pastor John MacArthur denounced Christian nationalism insofar as it is defined as an attempt to usher in the kingdom of God on earth through political means, but exhorted Christians to care about what is happening in their nation. And, you know, there's two key things that we have to see here is, is that it's a clear recognition that the people that MacArthur has in mind here are the post-millennial camp, which usually that's sort of the Doug Wilson crew right now. And another thing is, is that he's talking about the fact that there's a clear indication that even if you're not a Christian nationalist, you still care about this nation. You can still be a patriot. You can still care about ethics. You don't have to be a Christian nationalist to denounce these kinds of things. Really, what you have to do is you have to be a person who believes in the Bible. You believe in the concept of natural law. You have to believe in the concept of freedom that's given in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But notice this key phrase from John MacArthur here. He says, there is no such thing as Christian nationalism. MacArthur said during a question and answer period last month at Grace Community Church in Los Angeles. He says this, the kingdom of God is not of this world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, end quote. His kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of this world separates the world. They are not linked together. Now, I know what a lot of people are immediately going to say, well, that's two kingdoms theology. And, you know, you have Jesus's one king. Does he have this kingdom or does he have that kingdom? And I just kind of go, OK, I get what you're saying here. But first of all, how many people were having this conversation until just recently before the whole Christian nationalists, the theonomists started to come into this whole categorization? In addition to it, why should we feel like we have to be sort of behooven unto one particular era of theology that would have had sort of this, what they would have talked about as an integralist system in which they're putting the church and the state together in order to have the state enforce religious views? Why do we need to make that as the standard view that's taught throughout all church history? When the reality is, is that history has proven that to be a terrible decision. There are a lot of people who died in the name of religion under the banner of putting religion rightfully before the state. In addition to it, you know, people like myself who have Baptist convictions and who have a free state conviction, we look at this and we go, here's my problems with this. Um... People like us died during systems like that. People like us died from Roman Catholics and Protestants under systems like that. And in a society today, if that's able to be done, not only does it do away with the full concept of, you know, religious freedom that's been given to us in the United States of America, but it also means that whoever is in power is going to not only put Christendom into power, but they're also going to persecute those who do not follow Christendom. And that's one of the things that you look at with a figure like Stephen Wolf is he says that he wants to imprison 
banish or in in some respects, they would even do a capital punishment on public heretics in this regard. You know, I've listed all this in other talks. We're not going to put the quotes in here today, but it comes directly out of his book, The Case for Christian Nationalism. Andrew Torba explicitly calls Christian nationalism is integralism. And that's why I agree with MacArthur. And that's why I agree with this whole idea that Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. There's not a linking between the church and the state. And that in order for Christendom or the kingdom of God to grow, you must somehow use the state and the sword of the state in order to further the kingdom of God. With no further ado, what I want to do is I want to switch over here and I want us to just listen to what John MacArthur has to say on this particular matter. So this comes out of this Q&A session that he gave here. And what I want to do is just pull up a few things and we'll listen to it. Oh, good evening. Uh, good evening, brother John. Good evening, brother John. This is Arno uh, Babajanian. Yeah, Arno Babajanian. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, my question is this, uh, since the theological conclusion of the Great Commission is the victory of the Messiah, how should we consider biblical Christian nationalism, theonomy, and hopeful eschatology? Uh, that's a pretty big question, so let's just pick off Christian nationalism. I'll give you a simple answer. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as Christian nationalism. Um, the kingdom of God is not of this world. Jesus said that. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. His kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of this world is a separate world. They're not linked together. Let me say it another way. <clears throat> Nothing that happens in any nation, whether it's a um, communist nation, a Muslim nation, or a quote-unquote quasi-Christian nation, or an atheistic nation, nothing in that nation politically, socially has anything to do with the advancement of the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God is separate from that system. God in His sovereignty is building His church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, Jesus said. So the idea that you should link up some political effort, some political process, some social process, some gain of power or influence in a culture as part of the advance of Christianity is alien to Christianity. You never have our Lord approaching anything like that, nor the apostles and particularly the Apostle Paul. He sought to gain no favor with the Roman Empire whatsoever, or for that matter, with any other of the rulers that he ran into during his life. Now, that is not to say that we are indifferent to what happens in the nation. We've been talking about that the last couple of Sunday mornings. We, we, have, to, we have to be the people who uphold righteousness. We when we come to vote, we want to vote for that which is the m most righteous option. Uh, obviously, we can't vote in righteousness, but we, we have to vote in a way that reflects our commitment to the righteousness of, of God. So we couldn't possibly elect somebody who was an abortionist, somebody who was LGBTQ or LGBTQ affirming or, or any other deviation from uh, God's righteous moral standard. So it gets harder, doesn't it, nowadays? Because even sometimes when politicians are more conservative and anti-abortion, they, um, they may be sinful and wicked in some other categories. And um, it's very hard to find out who is really honest and who is simply dishonest and seeking power. But in the end, we do what we can with the understanding that the responsibility of the church is not to advance the kingdom of this world. That, that's a faulty viewpoint. Christian nationalism is usually tied to what is called post-millennialism. 
And that is the view that the church somehow, by influencing the culture, can bring in the kingdom of Christ. In other words, it's the idea not that Christ returns and sets up His kingdom, but that the church establishes His kingdom and then hands it to Him. That is not what Scripture teaches. What Scripture teaches is what we're learning from the book of Revelation. Things are going to get worse and worse and worse, and the end of human history is not the church triumphant reigning in the world and taking over the structures of human kingdoms. That's not what happens. At the end of human history, the the believers are persecuted and murdered, and that's the very opposite of what Christian nationalism would anticipate. So we believe the Bible teaches that things get worse and worse, headed toward the wrath of God, which we're seeing in Revelation, and then our Lord returns Himself to establish His kingdom, clearly what we read in the book of Revelation. Okay? Hi. I'm... I'm So one of the things that I want you to see here is, is that, you know, John MacArthur very clearly and very pointedly talks about the fact that he's not opposed to this idea that Christians should vote their Christian values. In fact, the whole concept of religious freedom would say you have the right not only to live out your religion, but to vote your religion. In addition to it, I think one of the things that we have to see here is, is that John MacArthur is trying to say that one of the key issues that we have to see when it comes to this issue of Christian Christian nationalism is not what do the scholastic reformers think or what did this era think or what did the Puritans think or what did this particular figure think? It all comes down to this whole issue of what does the Bible teach? And in particular, does the Bible actually teach this concept of an integralist system that they're arguing for? And they can say, oh, we don't believe in integralism. You guys believe in card carrying integralism, the integralism of the right. In addition to it, and I kind of like this, I favor this. I recognize that there can be differences of eschatology out there. But one of the key things that John MacArthur is talking about here is is that one of the reasons that this whole Christian nationalism is just thoroughly incorrect is that so much of what undergirds it historically, even if a few figures, I think Stephen Wolf claims to be an amillennialist. I actually think William Wolf has claimed to be an amillennialist. Others, I don't know, but I know some of the other ones like A.D. Robles and Doug Wilson and Jared Longshore and the whole, you know, New Inc. St. Andrew's crowd, they all claim to be post-millennialists. Well, my response to that initially is I have a whole video on our Christian nationalist post-millennialist. And my argument is, is ultimately, well, post-millennialism is false. And I give you several reasons for why post-millennialism is false. And then I start to argue for reasons why you shouldn't believe in that, because clearly I think the New Testament teaches a pre-millennial plan in that regard. But I think I agree with MacArthur here that one of the reasons that you should not believe in Christian nationalism is that the vision of how the church interacts in society is incorrect and the vision for its ultimate eschatology is incorrect. So what I think I look at here with John MacArthur is, is one, you need to have a proper understanding of the role of the church in society, a proper understanding of the kingdom of God and what it looks like going forward and the necessity of premillennialism and how it views and functions with eschatology. Now, here's one of the things that I want to pull up, and I know that it's going to be a little interesting here, is, you know, the issue of eschatology for many people today seems very, very difficult. You know, people will read this theologian, they're going to study this era, and they're going to try to read this particular movement into the whole situation today. And I go, it's really not that difficult. If you get your hermeneutic right, if you interpret the Bible with a literal, historical, grammatical method of interpretation, then you're going to start to realize that when the Bible says the nation of Israel, it means the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. And you're going to find that, you know, the different positions, premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism are going to have this difficult time because sometimes they don't get Israel right. And as MacArthur has said so many times that if you get Israel right, you get so much of your eschatology right. For example, when you look at Genesis 12, when God gives the, you know, the promise to Abraham, and then when he gives the land promise, these are unconditional 
irrevocable. And in order for them to be fulfilled, they must be a literal millennial kingdom reign of the Messiah on the earth. And one of the things that we find is, is that this land promise has not been fully fulfilled. And, you know, MacArthur has talked about this over and over and over again throughout his entire ministry. I think he's being, in many respects, utterly consistent with what he said here. But, you know, what we ought to see here, and I think what he's pointing out is, is that it's very evident that the sort of spike and rise of Christian nationalism, one reason, I think there's a lot of political reasons, I think there's a lot of fiscal reasons, I think there's a lot of other reasons, but one reason has been the resurgence of post-millennialism and really just a resurgence of the study of what could be this Puritan vision for society. Now, I like a lot of the Puritans. I think the Puritans get so many things right, even though I think they get eschatology wrong. But one of the things of the Puritans is that they had a theocratic understanding of how the law should function and how heresy laws should function and what the concept of religious freedom should be. And, you know, like I've said, I have a whole video dealing with that whole thing. So I don't want to repeat any of this here. But what I want us to do is make one comment and then jump into a little bit more with John MacArthur on this issue. You know, I find it's interesting is that what sort of put the nail in the coffin of Puritan post-millennialism. First of all, it was an, an exegetical return to premillennialism. People were returning to the concept of what we have seen over and over again, getting Israel right, understanding the place of the land within the Old Testament, to see that the entire Old Testament was premillennial in its outlook, to see that Jesus gave a premillennial outlook, that the apostles in Acts chapter 1 gave us a premillennial outlook outlook. But what really started to put it in was not just an exegetical reason, but you saw this whole idea, you know, the early founding into America. You see people talking about the progress that was taking place, the seeming Christendom of the West and the, the christening of America and the growth of Christianity within early America. And then what happened? Do you know what happened? World War One and World War Two came onto the scene. In fact, what people don't realize is, is that World War One, you know, the war to end all wars was such an atrocious war that when people just looked at the world that's around them and they read the fact that the Bible talks about as things get closer to the end, whatever that may mean, we're not date setters here, things are going to get worse. And, you know, you can be saying that things are going to get better. You can be saying we're going to have this long view of where the history is coming, this long view of how long the millennium is going to take place. But when, you, when you're literally seeing hundreds of millions of people in World War I and World War II die, there's no real easy way to say that the world is getting any better. There's no easy way to say that post-millennialism is the clear vision for what the Bible teaches on these particular matters. Now, let's change subjects here. We all can remember, and we're all very familiar with, one of John MacArthur's most famous sermons as it relates to this. Do you remember? He gave it at the Shepherds Conference a number of years ago, and it was titled this. John MacArthur, when he's, he's talking about this, he says this whole concept that every self-respecting Calvinist should be a premillennialist, or this idea of it as the articles used to read, John MacArthur defined self-respecting Calvinism as premillennial. And he talked about things that related to it, such as this, the nature of sovereign election, the nature of unconditional election, and the nature of God's purposeful election, and the sheer fact that God will always accomplish his purposes, and the idea that God's elect will persevere unto the end. So when you look at the nations that are out there, there's nothing special about the nation of Israel. There was nothing good about the nation of Israel. There was nothing wise about the nation of Israel. There's nothing powerful about the nation of Israel. And the point is, is that when you look at the nation of Israel, as it relates to all of the other nations, and you look at Abraham as he relates to all the other figures, they were all totally depraved in this sense. So when you look at this is that it fits the Calvinist understanding. Now, all these people that want to be reformed and they want to be Calvinistic in their understanding. Well, if you want total depravity, the nation of Israel in the, you know, the Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and the concept where you're seeing the, the patriarchs of the nation, they fit that category. Look at their lives. Look at the things that they did. But when God was calling the nation of Israel, there was nothing special about them. So why 
do we have the nation of Israel? Why do we see them rising up in the text of scripture? Well, you believe in unconditional election as the reform community, as we all clearly see that the text of scripture's teaching is this concept. So you find that there's nothing special about the nation of Israel. He didn't choose them because of anything that's good and good in them, righteous in them, something that makes them wiser, smarter, better, or more powerful. It's a true unconditional election. It's a purposeful election. I am choosing this nation for my purpose, for my goals. And it's not that it's just God is choosing them and they may not come. Is that when God chose the nation of Israel, that purpose was fulfilled. It was irresistibly fulfilled. In addition, not only is God's election of these people purposeful, it's going to continue unto the very end. And the whole point that John MacArthur made was that if you believe in the concept of sovereign election and the idea of God sovereignly electing people according not to merit, but unconditionally with a purposeful and this idea of that God's going to accomplish all of his purposes and that God's going to persevere his elect unto the end, then you should be a premillennialist. Why? Because God sovereignly chose the nation of Israel. God has made an irrevocable promise to the nation of Israel, not only to them as a nation, but the promises to a land and to a Messiah figure that who's going to rule over the Davidic kingdom in that regard. And that has not been fulfilled yet. So in order for him to reign for a thousand years, it requires a premillennial return of Jesus Christ. So, you know, another thing that people are going to say about this, and I know I can hear some of the objections they are going to say, well, you know, that's such a minority view. Well, there's been a lot of books that have talked about, you know, the early church and its premillennial overtones that were given to it. And you're going to hear people say things, well, weren't the, the reformers and the Puritans, you know, the, the hallmark, the height of theology, weren't they post-millennial? And my initial response to them is, is that, well, history is not a hermeneutic. Just because somebody believes something at a particular time or a group of people or even a large group of people believe something at a particular time is not a hermeneutic. What determines whether or not something is true is simply this. Does the Bible teach it or not? Period. It's as simple as that. In addition to it, you know, for many of the people who are Baptists in their understanding, we recognize this. We recognize that, you know, if you look, you know, the, the Bible clearly teaches believers baptism. But when you look at the history of the church, you see, you know, the Roman Catholics, you see the reform community, you see people with an Anglicanism, Lutheranism, Presbyterianism, and so on and so forth, that are all affirming infant baptism. But our initial response to them is, is that, well, history and a great number of people throughout history is not a hermeneutic. It simply comes down to this. We believe what the Bible teaches and we teach what we think the Bible clearly says. And the Bible means what it says, and it says what it means. So when it comes to this whole issue of you know, what about the Puritans? We recognize history is not a hermeneutic. But in addition to it, you know, I think with this sort of returned popularity of, you know, post-millennialism and amillennialism and all the rest, but post-millennialism in particular, you know, I think people start to forget the fact that there have historically been several key premillennial figures out there. You know, Charles Spurgeon was a premillennialist. Albert Moeller is a premillennialist. John MacArthur is a premillennialist. Walter Kaiser was a premillennialist. Norman Geisler was a premillennialist. James Montgomery Boyce was a premillennialist. Carl F. H. Henry was a premillennialist. Harold Lenzel was a premillennialist. D.A. Carson's a premillennialist. In fact, all of Trinity has historically required them to be premillennial. So Feinberg, and you're going to see issues with D.A. Carson in this, and you're going to see, you know, figures that are just reigning out of the whole system of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School were all premillennial. But in addition to this, you know, famous preachers such as Erwin Lutzer or, you know, the great Francis Schaeffer and the list could go on and on and on. So what I want you to ultimately see here is, is that, you know, we don't believe premillennialism because any of these figures were premillennialists. And we could add so many more to this. You know, we're not here just counting noses. 
I don't believe in premillennialism because John MacArthur believes in premillennialism or because Walter Kaiser believes in premillennialism or Carl Henry or Francis Schaeffer or any of the rest. You need to believe in something because you think the Bible teaches it. And you can go to the Bible and you can point to a verse and you can point to a clear, literal, historical, grammatical understanding of that particular text and come to that particular conclusion. So what I want to do here is I want to finish by pointing you to one more article. I'm going to put both of these in the link here. So let's switch to an evaluation scene here real quick. And I want to pull up a little bit more about where John MacArthur actually talks about this. You know, this was one of his famous series, and I'm just pointing this out by way of conclusion here. John MacArthur goes into so much more of this where he actually gives six sermons here on the issue of premillennialism. And in particular, since this is appealing more to reformed individuals who are premillennial, he gives six different sermons here on why every Calvinist should be a premillennialist. He goes into several texts. He goes into many historical issues. He goes into all these issues related to anti-Semitism and much, much more. So with that said, what I want us to do is I want us to just clearly come back to this whole idea of what John MacArthur was saying. And let's just remember one of the key phrases that John MacArthur says, there is no such thing as Christian nationalism. Now, what does he mean by that? Is there a thing in society? You better believe it. I think it's a Fed job that's being used to accomplish a lot of things that a lot of conservative Christians don't want in their society and they won't want for their neighbors. But do not be duped by this. I mean, as James Lindsay says, Christian nationalism is what, 10,000 times a federal op in this regard. But when you look at this idea of there's no such thing as Christian nationalism, it may exist in the world. But when you pick up the text of Scripture and you read the text of Scripture and you exegete the text of Scripture, there is no such thing as Christian nationalism taught in the Bible, period. And that should be our rule for faith in practice. So, you know, Stephen Wolf can go and find all these quotes from the scholastic reformers and this figure and that figure and a Puritan and Boston Commons and all the rest. But again, those things don't determine what we ought to believe. And if Stephen wants to prove his position, well, you're going to have to go to the texts of Scripture. You need to give us chapter, verse, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. I want to see it in the text of Scripture. And one thing that I have just you know, liked about John MacArthur so much is that even if you're somebody that disagrees with MacArthur on something, John MacArthur is not going to believe something unless he thinks the Bible clearly teaches it and he's going to take you to a chapter and a verse. So in that respect, be like MacArthur, listen to what MacArthur has to say and do what MacArthur does when it comes to his theology. Be a person of the book, follow the texts of scripture.